on this Columbus Neighborhoods, stories from the Civil War that still touch us today. Support for Columbus Neighborhoods is provided by... At American Electric Power, we've been proud sponsors of WOSU Public Media for many years and strong supporters of our headquarter city here in Columbus, both downtown and in neighborhoods like yours. State auto insurance companies, serving customers and communities for nearly a century. Today, a technology and transformation company. Risk takers, creators, innovators. A company defined not by its history, but by its people. State Auto. The Columbus Foundation. Smart philanthropy for a smart city. ColumbusFoundation.org. Bailey Cavalieri. Your relationship with your law firm doesn't need to be complicated. It just needs to be right. CODA. Keeps our community moving forward. Falgren Mortine Marketing and Communications. Think wider. Ohio Health focuses on you and your family with a mission to improve the health of our communities. And by contributions from these and other Columbus area families who support WOSU. Thank you. No battles were fought in Columbus, but the Civil War definitely defined the city's character. We're actually standing on the side of one of the first Civil War camps right here in Goodell Park and there are muster camps all over, but they're overgrown and mostly forgotten. There are little known stories too, like the one about Roswell Ripley, a Confederate general who was born on High Street in Worthington. It's a more complex story than a lot of people realize as it changed both sides of the war. Producer Cindy Gaylord has the whole story. We're up in Worthington at the birthplace of Roswell Ripley, one of the greatest Confederate generals of the Civil War. After graduating seventh in his class at West Point, Ripley settled in South Carolina, where his wife was born and raised. And together, they ran a successful plantation. If he had lived in today's world, he'd have been a computer geek or a math nerd. He was incredible at math. And it, as it turns out in the Civil War and before that in the war with Mexico, he was the only man who could fire a cannon and know pretty much exactly where the cannonball was going to land. The others fired lots of practice shots and then they adjusted the cannon, but Ripley could calculate the angles and hit what he was shooting at. Yeah. General Roswell Ripley was heralded as the defender of Charleston Harbor, the key port city for the Confederacy. Gentlemen, General. We've completed the measurements of the harbor as you requested. Thank you, Captain. The Union generals knew that if they could take Charleston Harbor, they could win the war. They planned an assault on Charleston, which should have succeeded. The newest ships in the world were the ironclad ships, before the wooden ships could be sunk by a good cannonball. But with these ironclad ships, it was much harder. So the Union sent in a fleet of eight ironclads and 24 support ships with more gunpowder and supplies to take Charleston Harbor and they were confident they could do it very easily but Ripley had done his homework and he had calculated angles and had various cannons ready to fire when ships reached a certain point in the harbor. Gentlemen, you are dismissed. And so in short when the ironclad armada attacked Ripley sank them all within two and a half hours and broke them all up and they were fleeing in panic. And there's even a bigger story connected with General Ripley, and it has to do with a man named Robert Smalls. Robert Smalls was a slave who worked on cargo ships in Charleston Harbor. Robert Smalls very quickly became familiar with Charleston Harbor and all the knowledge that was needed to run ships around. Well, he gets on a ship called the Planter, and he was charged with distributing to all the forts in Charleston Harbor supplies, orders, ammunition. He gets to be, in effect, the captain of the planter. And officially, blacks could not be uh, pilots or captains of ships. They had to have a white captain and a white crew. The white crew became familiar with how well Robert Smalls did in managing the ship with his slave crew. And they found that they could easily go ashore to some of the local taverns near Ripley's office and have a night on the town. 
So they left the ship in the custody of, of Smalls and the slaves. Robert Smalls was very bright and he also very much wanted freedom. So he told the other slaves, get your families out on Cole's Island. We're going to steal Ripley's ship and we will pick up your families and we will sail out to the Union fleet around Charleston Harbor and we'll turn over Ripley's ship to them. And that's what they did. And that's exactly what they did. They were very clever. They had the Confederate flag on it. They sailed out toward the Union fleet. And then at the last minute, as the Union fleet was about to fire on them, they pulled down the Confederate flag and put up a bed sheet and turned over the ship to the Union commander. This isn't the end of the story. Robert Smalls convinces who to make sure that African-American soldiers are used during the Civil War. Tell me that story. It helped Robert Smalls and others persuade Lincoln and the whole country that African-Americans could be great soldiers. African-American soldiers were used in the Union Army after that. Yes, they were used in the Union Army after that, and Robert Smalls himself was made pilot or captain of Union ships. And here's something to think about. If Roswell Ripley had not trusted slaves, had seen them as intellectually inferior, would Robert Smalls have ever been in a position to steal the plantar and surrender it to the Union forces? One of the great advantages for Ripley in being from the North, from right here on High Street in Worthington, was that he had a different perspective. He understood that slaves were closer to human beings than most Southerners believed at that time, and he said they can do it. And he trusted Smalls to run his ship around the harbor. He was probably bitterly disappointed when Smalls stole it, but I think secretly to himself, away from the public, Ripley might have thought, I wish all of my officers had the initiative and intelligence that Robert Smalls demonstrated in stealing my ship. <laughs> A defining moment in any conflict is how the victors treat their captives. Camp Chase over on Sullivan Avenue was a Civil War prison camp. 25,000 Confederate prisoners passed through its gates. Jeff Darby takes us there and reports that the Camp Chase Historical Society has rituals and traditions that honor both past and present. Ohio made a major contribution to the Union forces of the Civil War and Columbus was one of the important cities in the state that did so. But I bet you didn't know that there's a Confederate cemetery in Columbus. We're on the west side of Columbus along Sullivan Avenue, the 2900 block, at the Camp Chase Memorial Cemetery, where every year there is a remembrance of the Confederate soldiers who were imprisoned here and died here and never got to go home. Welcome to the 121st annual Camp Chase Confederate Cemetery Memorial Ceremony. Union Colonel William Henry Canoss organized the first memorial ceremony here in 1895. This year's Camp Chase Memorial Ceremony has just ended and I'm talking with uh, Monty Chase uh, who is on the board of the Hilltop Historical Society uh, and has a connection by name anyway with the camp. I do. Uh, through Sam and Chase, who share a common grandfather who came to America in 1639. So tell me the statistics. There were an awful lot of people who passed through Camp Chase. We know some never left, others did. And something were, like 150,000 Union troops passed through the camp, yeah, is that as, correct? Yeah, as Union recruits, that is as correct. Recruits. And four presidents. Andrew Johnson came through here. After Lincoln. After Lincoln, James Garfield and Rutherford Hayes and William McKinley. And how many Confederates were eventually cycled through the camp? Uh, eventually, uh, approximately 25,000. So many yeah. did go home. Yes, many did go home. Roughly 90%. That is correct. Well, and it's important that we preserve places like this. I can tell that it's important to you. It is important, Jeff, because uh, we are all Americans, and Canoss wanted us to remember that. It's on the statue, as you can see, that was dedicated in 1902. The arch has a symbol of coming together and where it comes together is that there's just one magical word. It says Americans. I remind people um, oftentimes that the reason why we remember these men so much, their fathers and their grandfathers were with men like Washington at Valley Forge and their sons and their grandsons and their great-grandsons have been with us in every war and every battle 
that we fought in this country since. And they're with us today in places like Fallujah and in Iraq and in, 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 um, in Afghanistan. Well, a place like this tells us a real strong story about who Americans are and what they can accomplish. And thank you so much for telling us the story. Well, thank you, Jeff. It was my pleasure. It was a great day. What actually happens to our trash when it's picked up? Find out about that story and more at Curious Sea Bus, where you submit a question online, and if voters agree, we report the story together. Look for stories, submit a question, or log on for a voting round at wosu.org slash curious. Why do we still study the Civil War? Why do we find it fascinating after all these years? There's a lot more than curiosity that drives some people, and we sent Javier to the west side near Camp Chase to find out more. I'm back in my old neighborhood, the Hilltop, at Dirty Frank's Hot Dog Palace. Today I'm meeting John Haas for lunch. He works at the Ohio History Connection and does a great deal of research on why the Civil War is still a hot topic of discussion. The moment of truth. That is your Glenn Beck, and this is my Woe Nelly. All right, thank you so much. There are six different hot dog choices and 29 different toppings. So John, a lot of people seem really interested in the Civil War. How many books have been written about it? Well, the number Library of Congress put out was 70,000, but that was about 10 years ago, uh -huh. and they've been producing several hundred a year since, and they, a lot of people said that 70,000 number's a little low. Well, some of the writing that we are starting to see more of now um, is maybe an attempt to change or reframe history in that secession happened because of states' rights, right. not so much um, because of slavery. Right. It's very touchy, very touchy when you're talking about race, and they don't want to bring up the fact that the cornerstone, as the word used in some of the Confederate secession documents, mm -hmm. the cornerstone of our existence is slavery. Mm -hmm. And in conjunction with that, white supremacy, because that was how it was maintained. You're talking billions of dollars of property that these southern slave owners, not only did they want to maintain slavery, they wanted to expand it, and they wanted the federal government and the northern states to help them do that. And they say the importance of slavery to our society. So it was about slavery. Yes, it was about states' rights. Sure, I want the states' right to maintain slavery. And I want the northern states to help me do that. They were upset at the northern states because the fugitive slave law was in effect, which means if a slave escaped, slave catchers were allowed to go to the north to capture them and take them back down south. But some of the northern states started passing these laws, state laws, saying that they would not allow them to do that. And the southern states were upset, saying, wait, we have the Fugitive Slave Act. We're allowed to do this, and they're supposed to help us do this. But the state said no. So you start getting these fractures and these not cooperating with one another anymore. And so, uh, so yeah, the bedrock is slavery. That's the cornerstone of the whole thing. But a lot of the modern people don't want to touch that. They don't want to. They don't want to go there. They want to say it was for some other reason. And so they bring up the states' rights reason. But most of the historians don't buy that. It just doesn't wash. Is there any motivation behind the that? that argument for state rights and, and is there a connection to like wanting to wave the Confederate flag? A lot of these current southern flags were remade in the 50s and 60s. They weren't like that before the, that Confederate battle flag segment was put in during the beginning phases of the civil rights movement. So, you know, the, the story about, oh, this is, this is a tradition and this is wonderful and we need this for our state's rights, you can't tell us what to do, eh, that, that, that doesn't fly either. Because uh, they just put it in, you know, in the 50s and 60s, some of them. So what are some of the other reasons that make studying the Civil War so relevant today? Um, the 13th and 14th and 15th Amendment to the Constitution. Now, the 13th, of course, ended slavery. Right. Uh, the 14th and the 15th uh, instituted civil rights and voting rights. 
when Reconstruction ended, all the soldiers went home. All these laws were passed. You had to be able to read. You had to be able to read a paragraph in order to get the right to vote. You had to own property to vote. A lot of these ex-slaves were sharecroppers. They didn't own any property, so they couldn't vote. And even now, you can see a controversy with the voting rights, because a lot of these states are now starting to institute, you have to have like a certain type of ID right. to vote. You have to, and a lot of people don't have them. Who are the people that don't have them? Poor minority people don't have them. So yes, in answer to your question, the Civil War is still relevant today. We see it every day from basics of reenactment to political problems with the states to the flag, and they're still publishing books on it, and there's still controversy involved, and so the Civil War is still relevant to what we see around us today. John Haas recommended a book called The Battle Cry of Freedom if you're interested in finding out more. Plus, there's loads of publications at the Ohio History Center. And there's Blue and Gray Magazine that's published right here in Columbus. It's especially recognized for its detailed guides of Civil War battlefields. Ed Lentz is one of the most noted local historians, and he's also a longtime advisor to the Columbus Neighborhood Series. We give him the stage now to tell us about Morgan's Raid. Morgan determined in his own mind that just simply crossing the river briefly and striking back wouldn't do much of anything. So he determined instead to take 2,500 Confederate cavalry, cross over into Indiana, and then sweep through southern Indiana across southern Ohio, attempting to draw off as many troops as possible before knifing back into the south. And that's precisely what he did in, the, in May of 1863. And he was extraordinarily successful. By the time he had reached central Ohio, he was being pursued by no less than 25,000 Union troops, most of them mounted. He decided to strike back south to get across the river at a place called Buffington's Island. Union troops repulsed him, forced what was remaining of his troops back across the Ohio River. With 700 men, he moved north, trying to find a place to cross the Ohio. He never found it. He was isolated in eastern Ohio, surrounded, and he and what remained of his troops surrendered to the dominant Union force. Most of Morgan's cavalry was sent to the Camp Chase Confederate prison located on the west side of Columbus. By the time the war ended, a prison camp designed to hold at maximum 2,500 troops was holding 10,000 Confederate troops. About 5,000 of them died there. About 2,300 of them are still buried there, one of the largest Confederate cemeteries in America. And many of those are Morgan's Raiders. Morgan himself and his senior officers, however, were sent to the escape-proof Ohio Penitentiary with the assumption that they would be kept there for the balance of the war. The idea was that there was simply no way that a person could easily escape from something that was three stone walls and an iron door. And for a lot of people, it was true. For Morgan and his officers, however, it only took seven weeks to escape from the escape-proof Ohio Penitentiary. But this stuff looks interesting. I can't imagine what that they have in common, but I bet you're going to tell us. All of these objects were made by the M.C. Lilly Company here in Columbus, Ohio. Uh, the company started in 1862 as bookbinders, and uh, by the 1880s, they were one of the largest manufacturers in the country of materials related to uh, fraternal organizations. I see. Well, let's start with the largest item. That's the the flag of Ohio flag. Well, this is the very first Ohio flag. Really? And uh, this is uh, the design that was created by John Eisenman that became uh, our state's flag in 1902. Is this the only state flag that isn't a rectangle? Yes. Uh, it's a swallowtail pen. It's sometimes called a burgee. What do the stars represent? There are 17 stars, and the 13 along the hoist 
represent the 13 original colonies. And then there are four stars that represent that Ohio was the fourth of the new state. So there's 17 stars in total that we were the 17th state in the union. And the red circle and in the white circle, what does that symbolize? The red circle represents a buckeye. Okay. And the, the circle represents Ohio. So the buckeye's been associated with Ohio for a long time. Yes. The gown is a ceremonial gown made by the same company that made the flag. And this is the candidate robe that was worn by uh, Warren, President-elect Warren G. Harding when he uh, was admitted into the Masonic Lodge. The sword in this scabbard is beautifully engraved and detailed. This must surely be ceremonial with this amount of uh, work on it. Yes, it's a presentation sword. It says, presented to Captain George Converse, U.S. Army, by Governor's Troop B, December 25, 1902. So it's a Christmas present. Yes. This would fit in a stocking nicely if you had a big stocking. <laughs> did they also make swords that were used in combat? They did. Uh, they offered a variety of uh, both service and ceremonial swords. So from bookbinder to ceremonial swords, that's quite, quite a story for a company here in Columbus. They um, survived all the way to 1953. Well, this is a great collection, very impressive. Thanks for sharing it with us. Certainly. We used a reenactment to tell our first story, the one about Roswell Ripley. Sometimes using actors is the only way we can tell these stories. And you saw Mark Holbrook, a 30-year veteran of reenacting. And a little side note, he usually works on the Union side, but was willing to help us out telling the Confederate story. Mark tells us there are compelling reasons why thousands of men and women dress up and act out battles of the past. In reenacting, we focus on the everyday people and the fact they're going through this momentous time and how did they do that. You get asked a lot, how, how do you make all this happen? How do you guys out there, you maneuver, you do all these things. How do you make that happen? You know, it's a lot to orchestrate. And the simple answer is we replicate the command structure and we follow the same training manuals that they did during the Civil War. There's, there's no better way to portray what they did than to use the tools they had. So we do that. Um, reenactors are not just reenactors on the weekends when you see them doing what they're doing. They're reenactors every day, doing research um, on both the history of the Civil War itself and what we call the material culture, and, and discovering every detail you can about the clothing and equipment and how people live their lives, which has actually proved very beneficial to anthropologists who are seeing these this time period recreated with exactly what people had at the time, so it's an invaluable lesson on how life was lived. One of the things that reenactors pride themselves in is working very, very hard at preserving history in, in its physical form. And that means historic buildings, artifacts, battle flags are a very important part of it, and battlefield acreage itself. You know, why would you spend all the money it takes to to uniform and equip yourself and to travel all over the country, to sleep on the ground at night, to you know, run around um, in, in hot wool and, you know, in the summer and all these things. And the answer is because you're doing it for something more than yourself. For the overwhelming majority of reenactors that I met over 20 years, they simply felt that it was so vitally important that our nation not forget what went on. And when we talk about that, what went on during the Civil War, what we're talking about fundamentally is this is an example of what can happen to us as a people if we cannot come together and figure out our problems and solve our disagreements. That's the overwhelming theme uh, for reenactors. Look at what happened. This is something we don't ever want to happen again. And so it's very, very important that we preserve that story. We bring it to life for people. People today live in complex worlds. 150 years ago, it was no different. That's our show. Thanks for watching. 
And remember, you can watch all our episodes on ColumbusNeighborhoods.org. Plus, see our stories on the WOSU mobile app. And you can follow us on Facebook, Twitter, and Instagram. We'll see you back here next week on Columbus Neighborhoods. Support for Columbus Neighborhoods is provided by... At American Electric Power, we've been proud sponsors of WOSU Public Media for many years and strong supporters of our headquarter city here in Columbus, both downtown and in neighborhoods like yours. State auto insurance companies, serving customers and communities for nearly a century. Today, a technology and transformation company. Risk takers, creators, innovators. A company defined not by its history, but by its people. State Auto. The Columbus Foundation. Smart philanthropy for a smart city. ColumbusFoundation.org. Bailey Cavalieri. Your relationship with your law firm doesn't need to be complicated. It just needs to be right. CODA. Keeps our community moving forward. Falgren Mortine Marketing and Communications. Think wider. Ohio Health focuses on you and your family with a mission to improve the health of our communities. And by contributions from these and other Columbus area families who support WOSU. Thank you.